I'm floating motionlessly. I'm 20 meters down on an isolated little island in West Papua. To my left, I see a huge variety of corals. Soft corals reaching out, grabbing nutrients out of the water. Hard corals displaying unique patterns and sensational colors, forming a complex variety of habitats for small fish which bounce up and down as I inhale and exhale through my regulator. I focus my eyes even closer on the sand in front of me. Small fish stare back, guarding their territory, watching for my next move. As the current increases, I move to steady myself on a small rock. Or is it a rock? A scorpion fish stares back at me, waiting patiently for its next meal. I look even deeper into this structure formed over thousands of years of compounding calcium carbonate skeletons. A nudibranch slides smoothly, searching for its mate, displaying an impressive variety of colours and patterns. For an animal with such an impressive display, it's a shame that they can't even see each other. I'm sure though that this mantis shrimp will appreciate the colours with probably the most advanced eyesight in the animal kingdom. It looks at me. What is it thinking? My computer beeps and alerts me to move to shallow water, so I look up. I look to my right, and I see the devastating impact of what us humans are capable of. It looks like a bomb has gone off here. As far as I can see to my right, there are upturned coral heads amongst a scatter of rubble and sand. Bomb fishing it's called, and it's still a practice that's carried out right throughout Indonesia to this day. Up until recently, the village fishermen didn't know any better but to use homemade explosives in plastic bottles to catch fish. For these islands, it's not too late, as unlike a lot of Southeast Asia, there is still a lot of coral habitat still intact, and through education initiatives, the local fishermen no longer bomb fish. A large proportion of the area has also been set up as a sanctuary zone to help rebuild populations of highly sought after fish, and stop illegal fishing. Still, there isn't much stopping fishermen from elsewhere coming in and doing the same thing. What good is a sanctuary zone with no enforcement? As external pressure increases from other areas with population growth, collapsing fish stocks and the need for food, the locals face even tougher challenges. Through education, locals are now starting to realise these threats and are being empowered to keep a lookout for illegal fishing activities, enforce new laws, and manage their fish for their future. Through setting up local businesses and promoting ecotourism, locals will eventually become more independent and fund the patrolling of their sanctuary zone. Ecotourism holds the potential to boost local economies while bringing a brighter future for their kids, especially those who are battling for things which are often taken for granted elsewhere in the world, like a proper education. Scuba diving tourism in developing countries can be a powerful way to help connect local people with their environment highlight the value of their natural resources and promote sustainable futures.